to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Stuart Lee, who is a member of the English Faculty at London College and Deputy CIO at the University of Oxford. And his research focuses on Old English, World War I literature, and depiction of J.R.R. Tolkien. Today he'll be talking about Catherine Morgan. Thank you very much. I didn't know I was the keynote, but that's fine. I, can, I will carry it off with more aplomb now. But thank you. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, the Battle of Malden. And this was a poem which was described by John Holmes in the Tolkien Encyclopedia as the old English poem that most influenced Tolkien's fiction. And whilst that's a, a slightly contentious statement, uh, there is an element of truth in it, and I, what I want to do today is not concentrate on Tolkien's fiction so much, uh, mainly about his academic work, and I'll let you make the links between the poem and what you all know and love. And I'm mainly going to be using Tolkien's unpublished academic papers, which are held in the Quadley, and I want to show the continued uh, interaction with the poem throughout his career. <coughs> so, let us start right at the beginning. Um, what you can reasonably assume that the Battle of Malden is and always was a core Old English poem that was taught at the university. Um, I'm sure you all know the, the poem itself, but it depicts the defeat of the Anglo-Saxons, led by uh, Beornoth. And by the way, Tolkien, of course, in his writings, always changes that to Beornoth uh, to try and uh, imitate the diplomatization of the Saxon. At the hands of the Vikings in 991, near the settlement of Malden in Essex, in true British fashion, it celebrates the defeat. It is widely taught now in Old English courses, as it was during Tolkien's lifetime. Indeed, Tom Honecker's observation that Tolkien probably knew the poem as an undergraduate is undeniably true, and it's very simple to eliminate the probably. A quick glance at Tolkien's personal edition of Sweet's Anglo-Saxon Reader, which was held in Bodley, the eighth edition, published in 1908, which has on the flyleaf J.R.R. Tolkien, Col Exon, Oxon Michaelmas 1911, shows that he worked on the Battle of Malden, particularly on pages 120 to 130, where he was making numerous pencil annotations in the margins of the poem. And as an aside, it showed the precocious talent of the young Tolkien because he was already taking Sweet to task by <laughs> noting that the editor had corrected all, had not corrected all the references in the glossary as a result of removing the text from uh, an earlier version. Skull and Hammond observed that in Trinity term 1915, Tolkien by now studying English, of course, sat exams which included Malden. And if you actually look at the exam papers from that period which Oxford set, which are, we put the uh, fear of God into any undergraduate nowadays, but uh, Malden was not actually explicitly uh, uh, examined on, but it would have been mentioned by any undergraduate who knew this soul, particularly in some of the questions around uh, the context of old English literature. After graduating, Tolkien's interaction with Molden is illustrated by books that survive from his personal library. Uh, there's his own personal copy of Sweet's A Second Anglo-Saxon Reader, which has J.R.R. Tolkien 1919 in the flyleaf, and also in his copy of Sweet's Reader, the ninth edition from 1922. This is completely disbound, and what would you would imagine was when he was at Leeds, he would have handed round pages of the book to the undergraduates to discuss the text. Uh, and what you see in these editions is careful annotation by Tolkien in the margins where he's trying to make connections with the poem, with other Old English poems or Middle English poems or other medieval texts which he knew about. So he's already trying to see Malden in the context of the wider canon. Perhaps even more interesting is what is not there in any of these books. It's worth noting, for example, that in all of the books there's no note, gloss or mark for the keyword word which was to occupy his thoughts so importantly, as we all know later on in his career. It's amusing also to note that Tolkien, like every student and teacher since, resorted to notes in the margins to get him out of problems when translating, and it brings a smile to, his, to my face in particular, because I've read his unpublished 1928 lecture entitled The Germanic Ver Verb, in which when he's, he's actually railing here against the, uh, the, the disparities of the English syllabus at Oxford, he draws on Malden as a rallying cry for defenders of philology in Old English, um, but he also says and mentions uh, Old English readers which have been well glossed in pencil in their witless way. He goes on to deride those, uh, particularly in the English faculty, who only wish to chat about Chaucer as their recreation, bemoaning the fact that in this university, Oxford of course, linguistic studies have almost reached the Malden, 
If you don't gallop off after the poltroon son of Odder, if you stay upon the field of battle where the best should be, then for heaven's sake let it be felt. You might save the school and yourselves as well. <laughs> after Leeds, Tolkien returned to Oxford, as we all know, in the 1920s, take up the chair of Anglo-Saxon, and he continued his interaction with the poem. Again, Skull and Hammond provide us with a useful summary. No evidence shows that he lectured on Malden more or less right up until the 1950s, and it seemed to rise in importance in the syllabus as Alfred, God bless him, was dropped. Of course, as you all know, Tolkien personally never produced an edition of the Battle of Malden, but his colleague, E.B. Gordon, did, 1937, and the collaboration between Tolkien and Gordon is a matter for considered debate, but it's notable that in the foreword to his edition, Gordon specifically thanks Tolkien for having offered considerable assistance and having helped out on all kinds of textual problems, specifically in the area of proofreading and making many corrections and contributions. Moreover, it's interesting to note that around this time, Tolkien was working on the famous Monsters and the Critics lecture, and here in the, in the section that discusses the heroic spirit and undefeated will, he draws our attention to Bertwald, one of the retainers at the end of Malton's exhortation, as a summative doctrinal expression of the ideal. Putting this together, then, in terms of our chronological exploration, it's clear from the lecture and the assistance he gave to Gordon that Tolkien was actively looking at the poem in the mid to the late 1930s in some detail. And this helps us to substantiate the commonly held view that around this time, Tolkien was also beginning his most ambitious engagement with Malden, the illiterative poem drama, The Homecoming of Bjorklund's Son. A play which, as you all know, was eventually broadcast on the BBC Third Programme in 1954, uh, and Skull and Hammond's dating noted that it had been worked on for 20 years is, is true. The play that was aired had also been published with the foreword entitled Bjorklund's Death, and the final piece which I'm sure we've all read repeatedly, entitled Ofer Mode in Essays and Studies in the 50s. And in hindsight, it is remarkable that that was ever accepted, if you've, if you've read it in the context of what else was going on in that journal. And even Tolkien himself was a bit embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. Tom Shippey summarises effectively the now confirmed view that collectively these three pieces said on Ofer Mode, it had firmly rejected the view of Malden put forward by previous scholars, including Tolkien's old colleagues and collaborator Edie Gordon and W.P. Kerr, who had called it the only purely heroic poem extant in Old English. Tolkien argues that Gordon Kerr and the rest were completely wrong. And as we all know, Tolkien's argument was that the poem was a deep critique of the heroic spirit and of the rash and irresponsible attitudes it created, and that the Malden poet, the Anglo-Saxon poet at the time, was criticising the so-called heroism of Beardnoth, and more importantly, his disastrous decision to allow the Vikings to cross the causeway. And he developed this idea within the play Again, on the handout, this is just to give you some examples, where Tidwell states that Beatnoff was too proud, too princely, and do me dared and died for it. Uh, that's from Manuscript 5 in Bodley. Tolkien also argued that the poem was not just criticising Beatnoff, but rather the societal values that led to his decision, a direct attack, therefore, on the idea of northern courage, which Tolkien had probably first encountered in Kerr's Dark Ages and Gordon's introduction to Old Norse. That speech at the end, where the uh, retainers rally around the Otnus corpse uh, and hang on to the bitter end, drew Tolkien's attention again and again. In his line-by-line -line notes to the poem, he states, these two lines are deservedly famous. In Old English, they are vigorous and sum up in a curiously compact and forceful way the special quality of northern heroism. Unless you admit defeat, you are not beaten. A cold, grim, and desperately hard creed, but a noble one, and not one that is at present in danger of being over-popularised and exaggerated. But to Tolkien, of course, the heroine was a double-edged sword, and he struggled to find defensible, even if it was admirable. Again, in an unpublished note on the topic, he declared northern heroism may have been how men fought on after their gods faded, but as far as it goes, and as a work in theory, it's absolutely impregnable. In other words, the sentiments expressed in Malden were a throwback to a pre-Christian attitude of death and glory, which had no place in the 990s, or indeed in the 20th century. And while one could admire the death of the retainers at the end, it was flawed. It was a flawed attitude to heroism that had also directly influenced Beatrice. And this the Christian poet Malden had recognised. The section entitled Ofer Mode in the, in the three-part essay, in turn, contains a direct character assassination of the old man, as being wholly unfitting, owing to a defect of character, no doubt, summarising that it was magnificent, perhaps, but certainly wrong, said Magnifique in Sinopala Guerre, too foolish to be heroic. And some observers have suggested that Tolkien here was expressing views which were shaped not only by his Christianity, 
but more importantly by his own experiences of war, notably those in the trenches of World War I. However, I don't agree. This doesn't mean that what Tolkien witnessed on the Somme directly struck a chord with what he read in the Battle of Malden, i.e. men dying, however heroically, because of the decisions made by leaders. He'll use phrase, lines led by donkeys. The problem is that if this is the case, then it is curious that Tolkien's criticism of Beardnoth was far from consistent and seemed to develop as the years went on. He does not appear to have come back from the front, raging like Siegfried Sassoon did, or reflecting on it with bitter irony in the 1920s as Robert Graves did. Tom Honegger notes in his essay that criticism of Beardnoth in Homecoming is not in the first two versions and only starts to appear in the later drafts. And this is substantiated if we now look wider at some of his other unpublished material. In Bodley Manuscript uh, 5, for example, in the various drafts of Beardnoth's death, which dates from around the 1930s, Tolkien describes the elderman as redoubtable and an old man of great vigour, commanding stature and renowned valour. In Folio 63, in a later draft of the same essay, he declares, The Northmen asked for leave to cross the ford so that a fair fight could be joined, and Beardnoth allowed them to do so, but he actually crossed out a comment which said, In his pride, preferring instead to note, But this act, whether of misplaced chivalry or of pride, Pride proved fatal. Chivalry certainly is not synonymous with pride. Elsewhere, in an essay on Wolfstan's sermon of the Wolf to the English, he describes Beardnoth as the great duke, complete with his valiant knights. And as is often the case in the unpublished manuscripts of Tolkien, we also have a full or partial translation of Old English texts, or his glossaries made to accompany them, and Mulder <coughs> is no exception. On your handout, you will see uh, an extract from the full translation that uh, Tolkien did of the poem, and with specific reference to the issues surrounding these lines in Molden of lines 89 to 90, as you can see, he says, then the chief earl, in pencil, he puts it up, in his over, he inserted at the much later point, confident chivalry, conceded too much land to the hateful people. So the curious translation of over mode as confident chivalry, even if he inserted the intensifier over, and then at a later stage, overconfident, can it best be ambiguous, but I certainly does not feel like outright criticism. And finally, in Tolkien's unpublished lecture, although there is a version of it published, um, I think it's in The Fall of Arthur, the Anglo-Saxon verse, which he uh, broadcast first on the BBC, but then rewrote several times throughout the uh, 40s, um, he never explicitly criticises Beardnoth in the albeit brief sections he devotes to Malden. He notes Beardnoth was a Christian duke, greatly honoured by the church, and tall, six and a half feet, white-haired, vigorous, old warrior man. Which is actually true. When they dug up his body, they found he was very tall. Mm -hmm. Bringing this together, where exactly does it leave us? It's undeniably true that by the time of the essays and studies, Tolkien had clearly cemented his views on Beardnoth and how he would consider Ophamode. But to suggest that Tolkien was imposing his views from the trenches on this uh, is stretching the point somewhat. It's also quite ludicrous. Uh, a scholar of Tolkien's merit would not reread Old English in the light of his experiences, his personal experiences. He, he was much too exact on words. Moving on, because of the article in Essays and Studies, scholarly attention concentrating on Tolkien's engagement with Malden has just seemed to concentrate around this whole discussion of Ophamode. However, that's only part of the story. As one would expect of a scholar of Tolkien's abilities, discussions on the poem were far more uh, wide-reaching. There's the question of authorship and the identity of the poet. We, it's anonymous, as, as far as we know, but Tolkien, at a couple of points, uh, seems to think the man was certainly an Essex man. And like many scholars, Tolkien was acutely aware of the issues surrounding the survival of Malden, which he observed had been exacerbated by the errors of an 18th century antiquarian whose knowledge of Old English was very small. Um, I don't have time to go into it, but you should go away and read his unpublished Lecture, uh, essay or lecture, Old English Textual Criticism, where he engages with the transmission of Malden uh, to the present day. But he concludes, how did Malden, for instance, reach a written form? It may have come straight to the author, some clerk, reverencing the memory of Beardnoth, may have heard or heard of the poem celebrating his last battle, and knowing its maker have taken pains to take it down. But it's more probable that it already gained some currency and passed through several mouths before this happened. So he's saying this isn't a, a first-hand account of the battle around 991. It seems to have things passed on. He concludes that the meaning survives rather than the exact expression. He was interested in the characters of the poem. He provides extensive notes on those, all the protagonists. The wider manuscript tradition, its original length, it's incomplete as we have it now. He thought it was about 
400 lines or possibly much longer. And he also provides line-by-line -line notes, as I've said. Of particular interest was the language and poetic style of Molden, which kind of brings me on to the topic of today. And throughout all his published, unpublished papers, there are constant clues to his work in this area. And there are a couple of papers which I don't have time to talk about now, but one in particular. First is his lengthy study on alliteration on G in Molden which may rock your boat, but um, <laughs> if not, there's a line there which is very famous one, line 192, which calls, has caused scholars in Old English much angst, and can hear you angst. Uh, Tolkien talks about it and other, and other lines, uh, particularly uh, with, with the G problem in Old English, and just concludes, uh, in classic Tolkien fashion, that Old English verse at this time was written by ear, not letter, even in the late 10th century, which opens up a can of worms about literacy in Old English and oral transmission and how people were composing poems, but he just plunks it out there because <laughs> I've made my case. Uh, just on that one, uh, he obviously, when he was lecturing, would have had to try and grapple with stressing sort of palatal G's and and so on like that. And there's an amusing aside, um, I think it's in that lecture, he was conscious of the problems this might have caused, and in one of his, in one of his notes he says, I've been spending part of my absence in having, having numbers of teeth removed, including much of the front facade. And teeth are necessary, or even the least instructed in phonetics will realise, for dental consonants. My mouth is therefore filled with unaccustomed crockery, which may fall off its shelf. Which <laughs> would have been quite a sight. However, returning to the previous point, um, and the, uh, on how poets learn their craft, which I guess is the, is the subject of today as well. Tolkien picks this up in another major piece, which um, I, would, I think there's a PhD, well, I mean not PhD, but there's certainly an article in here for someone, in his unpublished essay, The Tradition of Versification in Old English, with special reference to the Battle of Molden and its alliteration. This is a complicated and far-reaching work, which appears to have been written well before Homecoming was finalised, and possibly then was sparked off by Gordon's 1937 edition. And what, he, what he's trying to do is think, how did people write poetry in Old English, pretty much. Um, he rejects the idea of professional minstrelry, he uses the term minstrelry, it's not me, it's him, he uses this for the Old English period, with some form of apprenticeship. He did feel that poets would have learned their skill through absorbing what they heard in the home where people recited verse, which he argues must have been common because Cadman, the first Old English poet that we know of, is ashamed because he is an exception. This is in was important for a poem, as a poem, he argues, perishes even if it is being uttered. So to survive almost in a Darwinian sense, it needs to be recited, or as he puts it, to live, it must be preserved in memory and be often repeated. And men die quicker than pictures or monuments and the time soon comes when the memory must pass into a different mind and the repetition to another mouth or person. And again, I don't have time to make links with this, but obviously you might be making links with the Book of Lost Tales and all that about the early transmission of the Elvish history. It does go on that in, in, in some depth, that essay. It's, it's, it's a fascinating read. Um, he also notes, though, and one of the key issues about Malden is that as some people have said, it's not very good old English poetry. And he turns his attention to the verse forms in Malden, which he notes was from a period before, which I think he's referring to the 20th century here, meter sank to stuttering, and good spelling was overthrown by bad French to its lasting confusion. No offence to our colleagues who spoke earlier this morning. This is Tolkien's words, not mine. The main problem with Malden is it does not seem to adhere to the strict rules of meter witnessed in earlier Old English verse. And the reasons put forward are varied, but they tend to fall into two theories, that the Malden poet is either good, was either, sorry, is either bad or not very good, or bad and not very good poet or verse and so on, and is demonstra- or finally, is demonstrating a breakdown of the formal rules of Old English poetry as we move into the 11th century. Tolkien decided to look at this from a completely different angle by concluding that comparing Malden with other earlier Old English poems, like Beowulf, the classic one, for example, uh, was not what was called for. In effect, he was arguing that when considering Old English poetry, one needed to recognise there were separate prosodic varieties of composition, as opposed to traditional view of separate chronological periods. So basically, what if you go to an Old English lecture now, they'll tell you there was very good Old English poetry written in the 7th or 8th century, we have it recorded down, and by the time the 10th century it was breaking down. He's saying, don't look at it, it's sort of like century by century, think of different types of poetry. Which is quite important, 
However, he goes on and he categorizes Old English poetry into four different categories, which is wonderful. Uh, first of all, there is strict, strict um, epic, uh, fornith love, like in, in Old Norse, written by monks with notable characteristics of the reduction of Anacrusis and so on. There's poetic or emotional verse, prose with verse elements in varying degrees. There's the chronicle poems, which you get in so Anglo-Saxon chronicle. And finally, there's what he calls freer verse, again written by monks with, with greater freedom in the off verse. And he cites Maldon as an example of this. Freer verse, he says, was more hasty, or rather less formal, than the long poems that had survived from an earlier age. So he didn't mean that the lines in Polden, Molden, that do things never done in Beowulf, were necessarily bad lines made by a bungler or a man in a hurry. Instead, they were simply of a different style written by a minstrel plain, as opposed to a minstrel turned scholar, which characterizes the Beowulf poet, for example. So returning to the discussion of how poets learned their craft, in this context then, Tolkien has argued that meter and metrical rules could not simply be forgotten. People just didn't hear poetry and then walk out and forget how good Old English poetry was recited. Remember, Beowulf was written down around the year 1000. People knew what good classical Old English poetry looked like in that sense. Um, and it would have been a continuous flow of learning and performance over the generation. The only way it could have completely changed is if there was a major catastrophe, and he didn't see that there was one that happened in England throughout the uh, middle to late Anglo-Saxon period, even the Viking Wars, which is the obvious one he would point to. Meter could change, he argued, due to phonetic factors, and poets would adopt different meters if required to do so due to linguistic style or pressure. But even then, any new meter would be related to an old one, and the old one, as poems elsewhere, was demonstrate was still there. Either way, taking all of this together, neither of these supported what he felt the accepted contemporary theory that somehow Old English meter had suffered from some slow disintegration over time, which is what many critics thought led to the oddities of Maldon. Maldon then, as we have it, this is his words, probably is to be regarded not as a piece of uncertain metrical skill, but as a survival by fortunate chance of the kind of less polished and compacted verse that was made to celebrate events while the news of them was still hot, and was accepted for what it was, a poem in a freer mode, a kind that was seldom committed to writing at all. In a sense, it was a popular kind, and for that very reason, it's more, or less, more in the direct line of ancestry to Middle English alliterative verse. To conclude, it's undoubtedly true that many Old English scholars will have filing cabinets of notes and annotated books in their cellars, myself included, which, if collected, would form an interesting journey through their interactions with the Battle of Molden. But we rarely, and probably never should, do this. <laughs> However, Tolkien is special for all the reasons uh, which I'm sure we all agree. But in particular, I hope that I've shown in this paper that looking at his unpublished material, we can unearth some interesting stuff, as other scholars in this room have done, such as Demetria and Andrew as well. I'll leave it to all kinds of people who are younger and wiser than me to pursue the idea that Maldon is an example of a freer type of verse that was around for centuries and not a degeneration of old English metrics, as many people would say. But if nothing else, it reminds us again, and I'm sure Tolkien would absolutely love me to say this, that the old English period and old English poetry is a wonderfully complex topic and continues to defy categorization or simplification. To use a quote I've used elsewhere from Tolkien himself, you can, if you like, speak of an Anglo-Saxon period in history before 1066, but it's not a very useful label. You might as well label all the jars in the top shelf in your store cupboard as preserve and all the rest jam. In actual <laughs> fact, there was no such thing as a single uniform Anglo-Saxon period, just a time when all men wore funny trousers with cross straps and ate too much pork and drank too much beer. The time whose chief events were the burning of some cakes by Alfred and the wetting of Canoon's feet. That is a legendary time that never happened or existed, and it is not nearly as interesting as the real thing. <laughs> Right on the annotated um, <laughs> Battle of Maldon, which is, is always a, a scribble. Um, something you mentioned about 
you're not beaten unless you admit defeat. I guess that's particularly pertinent to the Lord of the Rings with when Frodo standing at the crack of doom has to say <coughs> the ring is mine and that sort of defines the moment when you realise that he is unable to destroy it. Yes, yeah, I, that, there was absolutely right and there's all that idea about you know people hanging on, fighting against all hope, etc. Um, and there's a couple of pages which I skipped through, which are all the links with the Lord of the Rings, which I kind of explored a bit in the um, Keys of Middle-earth, you know, the Eleanor feels the death of Théoden, the death of Vietnam, it's, it's very similar in that sense. Um, I mean, to me, what I, I began to sort of thinking about this, having um, just been teaching the children of Huron and reading it again, he's grappling within that text, I think, um, how, what do you do in the face of overwhelming odds? And he presents in the Children of Huron a series of options, none of which work out. Um, you know, you pick your horse, you're going to lose, basically, uh, in, that, in that text. And I think he's struggling with it, and he's struggling with it with this text as well. And you could argue uh, that he actually he reaches the answer in the Lord of the Rings. He does, he does come up with the perfect balance of courage and wisdom, which you get, and it can be in a hobbit, or it can be in a, another character. And I see that as sort of, that, that could go back to the trenches, of course, you know, what, what do you do in these, these choices? Um, so yes, there is definitely going to be a Yes? Um, this is probably a really ignorant question, but um, has anyone uh, looked at, you know, the, uh, that talk you might have had a very sort of personal reason for being obsessed with that overmind? Because it's a derivative. The name Tolkien is a derivative series. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I skipped over that, so there is the old play on. And, sorry. No, 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 it's not your fault. I, uh, this, is, this is a longer uh, article, which may get published one day, but for um, anyway, reasons I won't go into. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So there's that play on words and, and things like that. Um, yeah, so he could definitely be playing around with that because he would have come across the word. It's, it is an odd word, uh, and you, you do searches in... Old English, the Old English corpus, and it clearly is a negative connotation. No, no, it's not. I think what I'm saying is, I think actually, I understand his interpretation, although if you read subsequent scholarship, particularly since 1991, there's been a lot of argument against we might be overplaying this reaction, led by Tolkien's article, that, you know, from a military perspective at least, it was the right decision make even though they lost um, you know so I, but what I'm saying here is that that link that people make with those that tripartite of essays to Haig or someone like that I think is, is a misconception of all this. Yeah, briefly, um, I think it may be in my Morris essay but I did remark, didn't put it there, that the names of the two main characters come uh, directly from the Erendel poem. Yeah. Uh, Tors and Tida they're perhaps in the fourth or fifth line of the Arendt poem. I That's right. They, and the other thing is... Um, they change the names though, don't they, in the drafts? Oh, which Tom Honegger will tell you about. Yeah. Um, also, would there be notes in these sweets reader about the Fall of the Angels poem? Because I thought there's overload in that. <coughs> and this is a very early version of the Fall of Lucifer, which um, went into the mystery plays, but it's, a, it's not in the Bible, obviously. <coughs> So it's a few years since I've looked at those, his books, um, and obviously you do use the glossary there which refers you back to the text. I'm pretty certain I checked every occurrence of Ophamode in there yes. to see if he'd made an annotation of it, and he hadn't. But of course he's a student, it may not have been what he was being taught by whoever it was, uh, Fernval or Kerr. Or... <laughs> Essay. I think it's in his uh, versification essay, and he, he lists a strict verse, which he thinks um, to uh, an equivalent in, in Old Norse, poetic or emotional verse, chronicle poems, and freer verse. Those are the four categories he puts it through. Most of it, like Beowulf or Judith, would fall into the first category. The stuff we tend to always read. And stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you very much, Stuart, for that amazing talk.